was just scary to uh, get down that route and think about the idea of, of, of you know, taking my own life. You, you wrote, what people on the outside don't always understand is that it takes all of your strength and willpower just to exist. Explain that. Suppression is, it's exhausting. Uh, I just wanted to lock myself in a dark room and, and never come out. Um, and there were times where I'd only come out to, to either eat, to uh, you know, play basketball, to go to work, and that was just kind of my, my outlet, my safe space. So when that's taken away from me, it's even more exhausting. But I think it just, it's an accumulation. It just adds up when you have expectations, when you're playing in front of you know, 25,000 fans, plus all the people watching on TV that aren't knowing that you're dealing with this stuff on top of you know, what you're dealing with away from the court as well. It just is completely and utterly exhausting when you have a chemical imbalance and you haven't been able to get it right. You wrote, uh, some of the darkest moments of my life happened when the crutch of basketball got taken away. Yeah. And that season where you've only played uh, 18 games mm -hmm. uh, for, for the Timberwolves, uh, you know, you pretty much, as I understand it, locked yourself in your apartment, rarely came out of your bedroom. Uh, why? It's just, yeah, I mean, that crutch of basketball was everything to me. That was my, my safe space. Listen, I love basketball. It's, it's what I do. It's not who I am. And that was something that I had to, you know, really face and learn. And when I had an injury, it was really tough for me to, uh, you know, comprehend or understand what I was going to even do with myself. So I didn't have another escape. And on top of that, I'm not around my teammates. I'm living alone. My social anxiety got to such a high point where I didn't want to go outside. And that was a, uh, yeah, it was just a really, really dark moment, uh, point Excuse me, in my life that is, you know, tough to revisit. But this went on for months, months, because I played 18, 18 games and had no uh, real um, healthy way of not only expressing myself, but just to bring myself out of it, you know, because, again, you self-medicate, you... You, or, you know, you drink, you, you know, treat your body terribly, you eat terribly, and um, you just pretty much do everything to, um, to harm or hurt yourself. You're in your bedroom, blinds drawn a lot of the time, you know, no TV as you wrote. Like, what, do you, what, what are you thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously, uh, you know, when you get to, to that point and it's day after day being the same, you come to a point where you know, the darkest moments come into play and, and you know, suicidal thoughts come into play. And that, that the, you know, you start, you know, planning it out and, you know, what would be the, the, the route you would take. And that is, uh, yeah, those are um, really scary moments in my life. What were you gonna do? Uh, I mean, I had a number of ways. I mean, it's, you know, the good thing that happens is when you do search that, it, it comes up with the National Suicide Prevention Line. There was a couple ways that I had toyed with, but it was just scary to uh, get down that route and think about the idea of, of, of you know, taking my own life. But it was, um, you know, something that crossed my mind pretty, pretty often, especially when you're in a, mo a moment like that. Did you ever uh, attempt to? No. Thankfully. When you were in those really low places, you said um, there were a couple of your friends that helped in getting you through it. What happened that got you out of it? Um, I think, honestly, part of it was because of my relationship with, with basketball. Part of that saved me, just getting healthy. But, um, you know, I think it was just knowing that I've been so fortunate and so amazingly blessed to have a group of friends that like truly want nothing else other than to just, uh, you know, be there for me and to have this relationship. Does it ever get to a point anymore where you still have su suicidal thoughts or I think, that listen, no if more? you've been down that road and I don't, you know, I don't know how, you know, if whoever's going to watch this who's, who's had those thoughts before, I think it does cross your mind. And I've just learned to speak my truth, honestly. I've learned that, you know, nothing haunts us like the things we don't say. So me keeping that in is actually more harmful. So I think that's been the biggest and most helpful thing for me is exposing it, understanding that, um, you know, it, it is going to make me vulnerable and maybe put me in a, a, a spot where 
uh, you know, for most people it could be tough, but I know that there's a whole you know, group and a strength in numbers out there of people that are dealing with it. And, you know, if we have more people that pay it forward, uh, you know, like we've seen across um, a number of sports and a number of walks of life, that's going to be better. And you said even now with all the work you've done the, the past couple of years, some days are still brutal yeah, heavy, for you. Super brutal, yeah. Just because you, you don't get to choose when, you know, you don't get to turn it on or turn it off. But it's more so... You know, I, I tend to feel other people's pain and then not take care of myself. Uh, I think it's been, you know, the isolation of COVID. Um, you know, I think it's been, um, you know, obviously everything that's going on in America, social injustice, I mentioned anxiety rates tripling uh, from the second quarter of 2019 to 2020, as well as depression rates quadrupling, like that kind of stuff. When it's, uh, the future seems meek and it seems like it's, it's uh, you know, things aren't going to end the way that you want them to. I think that can put you down a very slippery slope. It's funny, actually, through COVID, I've, I've tried to connect a lot of dots looking back. And while, you know, I've, I've obviously have days that I, I really do struggle, I suffer a lot from imposter theory as well. Like, I, I sometimes don't feel uh, deserving. I don't feel like I'm, I'm worthy of, you know, what I've accomplished or the success I've had. And a lot of times I feel like a fraud because I don't feel like I've achieved enough. I look back and there are times that, that I do uh, wish I could change, but I think in moving forward, you know, why that is painful and, you know, those, those, you know, scars are, are there. They don't always fully heal. I think it's, it's, you know, something that adds to the, to the evolution in a lot of ways makes you better listener, makes you hear people out more, and just makes you more empathetic. It just doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from, what resources you have. It's if, you know, you don't continue to work on this, you're going to continue to have bad days, but... How did that HBO doc on Robin Williams after his death really resonate with you? Oh, he's, I mean, he's, if, if you grew up with his movies and, uh, you know, his stand up and his personality, you would have thought, you know, that's not a face of depression. That's not a face of, of, of mental illness. When you don't face those certain fears or those anxieties or that depression head on, uh, that just puts you even farther back and then you self-medicate. And when that doesn't work, it sets a baseline and puts you back even more and then you self-medicate. Uh, you know, it's, that's the slippery slope, right? So, um, I think that was that was something that I learned from him was like, uh, you know, that achievement aspect of it. Like, it's not just going to happen if you just keep taking yourself to higher, higher heights in your profession. You have to, you know, work on yourself and you know work on these other things and also have, you know, a, a form of escape in your life that's going to be healthy and beneficial for you away from the court.